Hello, and this is Herosia Soft Bubble. This is Herosia Shive here with another episode of Herosia Soft Bubble. On this episode, I'm going to be reviewing a uh, Bitcoin company called 21 Co. Uh, we're going to go in depth about um, the services I've utilized as well as the services they provide. Um, it's a very interesting, almost kind of niche, but not niche if it ever were to. I uh, hit the mainstream. It will be a, a significant player uh, within the uh, tech uh, market, but just in general for the internet. Uh, but before we discuss what uh, 21 Co is and all the, and the details, um, the news. So, Boozum St. John head, heads to Uber from Apple. Uh, eventually, we're going to talk about uh, Uber. I've decided to devote a week of episodes discussing um, Uber in of itself. Um, it's had a lot of problems. What it means for um, the sharing economy. Is Uber really a sharing economy um, company? And just all the details when it when it comes to that particular company and the product that it produces. Uh, but this happened during the whole um, the story broke during the whole Apple week, if you will. So uh, Last week ahead of the WWDC, there, there was a ripple of news when um, Axos discovered that Boozum St. John, one of the more noticeable execs at the company for, for being a woman of color who led an Apple Music demo at the previous year of WWDC to some acclaim, was leaving Apple. Now TechCrunch has learned uh, where she's landing and she's going to Uber. So <clears throat> this is an art- article from TechCrunch written by Ingrid Luden. So we received the news via a tip and, we, and have confirmed that the appointment through multiple sources at Uber. The company we understand views the appointment as, an important, as important in helping turning the tide on recent issues. As for what role she was taking, there's something that we're still trying to figure out. We understand that Uber will be making more detail public, details public later. Uh, St. John's track record is in marketing, most recently at Apple, but also with a long stand at Pepsi, among other places. Uh, there's an update in the article. She's going to, yeah, I was about to state this. She's going to be their branding officer uh, for Uber. So she's going to help kind of turn the tide towards an, a lot of the negativity that Uber has been getting. Uh, the appointment is key move for Uber that can help shore up the confidence in the company, both internally and externally, as it fights to justify its uh, $70 billion valuation by investors. Uber has been under fire for months for its management practices and company culture. Some critics and competitors are looking to look to drive business away from the company with a uh, delete Uber campaign, um, which has been working to some extent. Uh, in terms of executive news, most of, of it in the last six months has been about departures rather than hires. Those who left Uber in the recent times have included the VP of Maps and Business Platform, Brian McCullen, uh, President Jeff Jones, or not Jeff Jones, Jeff Jones, uh, AI lead uh, Gary Marcus, Communication S- uh, SVP Rachel uh, Whetstone, VP of Global Vehicle Programming's uh, Sharif Markby, uh, VP of Product Ed Baker, SVP of Engineer Amit Sengali, and self-driving car head Anthony Olavosky. Uh, St. John also has been head of global and consumer marketing for iTunes and Apple Music, was a surprise hit at last year's WWDC conference. Her charismatic appearance on the stage not only gave the dad joke prep event a little more oomph, but it also underscored a bigger conversation we've been having in the tech industry about diversity, strong role models, and which companies have been taking the leadership position in that area. Uber's record on diversity is not brilliant, but we, but as we have pointed out, it's not the worst either. And hiring St. John uh, speaks to how this continues to evolve. Regardless of whether she takes a marketing role or something else, St. John uh, coming on board is part of Uber's effort to reposition itself as a different kind of company than it has been in the past. That repositioning has been ongoing. Uh, just yesterday, the company announced a new hire, uh, Francis Free, an academic from Harvard Business School, taking a new role as SVP of the Leadership and Strategy. There's also a report coming soon with the results of an investigation by the former Attorney General uh, Eric Holder, uh, which has come out and wasn't very positive, it was actually quite scathing, into the company's management culture, which was spurred by allegations of sexism and other criticisms of the company culture. Amidst the bad news, Uber continues to see growth. It was the first quarter this year. Revenues were up uh, 18% over the previous quarter to $3.4 billion, while losses were $780 million. Uh, down with from over 900 million the quarter before. Uh, between Q3 and Q4 of last year, Uber grew by 74%. A note seasonal fluctuations. Uh, Q4 is the holiday season as part of the reason for this dramatic shift, and Uber has not released uh, year-on-year figures. So um, yeah, Uber's a bit of trouble. I think is an indicator of uh, overall uh, 
in the tech industry and maybe being in trouble. I know a lot of acquisitions that are going on, like the biggest being um, Amazon buying up Whole Foods. But I think there, I'm not saying it's a bubble, but I think there there's a downturn that's going to be coming in when it comes to these um, these companies and their valuations and their IPOs. But we'll discuss that on um, a word for the metaverse. Now this comes from Torrent Freak. Uh, Torrent Freak is a great site that does um, a lot of, you know, basically in the torrent and peer-to-peer uh, news. Uh, this concerns um, devices like Kodi and um, jailbroken uh, fire sticks. This is written by Ernesto. Hollywood sees illegal streaming devices as piracy 3.0. After hunting down torrent sites for more than a decade, Hollywood now has a more complex piracy threat to deal with. According to the Motion Picture Association, illegal streaming devices can be seen as piracy 3.0, offering a Netflix-like experience to consumers but without the right shoulders, right, the right holders uh, getting paid. Piracy remains a major threat for the movie industry. MPA Stan McCoy says yesterday during a panel session at the St. Petersburg's uh, International Economic Forum. After McCoy praised the cooperation between the MPA and the Russian authorities in their fight against online privacy, uh, privacy the President and Managing Director of the MPA's EMEA region noted that the pirates are not standing still. Much like Hollywood, copyright infringers are innovators who constantly change their, their business models and means of obtaining content. Where torrents were dominant a few years ago, illegal streaming devices are now the main threat, with McCoy describing their, their rise as piracy 3.0. Piracy is not a static challenge. The pirates are great innovators in their own right, so even as we innovate in trying to pursue these issues and pursue novel ways of fighting piracy, the pirates are out there coming up with new business models of their own. If you think of the old-fashioned peer-to-peer piracy as 1.0 and then online illegal streaming websites as 2.0 in the audiovisual sector, in particular, we now face challenge number 3.0, which is what I call the challenge of illegal streaming devices. Uh, the MPA boss went on to explain how the new piracy, piracy ecosystem, the new breed of pirates relies on streaming devices such as set-top boxes, which often run Kodi and are filled with pirate add-ons. This opens the door to a virtually unlimited library of pirate content. For one movie, there may be hundreds of pirate links available, which are impossible to take down in an effective manner by the right shareholders, he added, while showcasing the Exodus add-on to the public. Uh, McCoy stressed the devices themselves and software such as Kodi are probably not illegal. However, the addition of copyright copy infringed pirate add-ons turns them into an unprecedented piracy threat. The device itself is probably not illegal. The software itself is probably not illegal. Uh, the confluence of these three of these in a major category is a killer for online piracy, McCoy said. McCoy went on to say that the new piracy 3.0 is not the popular, not that popular in Russia yet. However, the UK and America and several other countries are already huge, uh, matching the pop- popularity of legal services such as Spotify. The result is the private service is operating on a truly massive scale. The scale of this kind of piracy, while it's not huge in the Russian Federation, has reached epidemic levels similar to the major services like Spotify and markets like UK and other markets in Western Union and North America. This is not the new sort of global Netflix, but not but no right sh- shareholders gets paid. Uh, the MPA chief stressed that this new form of piracy should be dealt with through a variety of measures, including legislation, regulation, consumer education, and voluntary agreements with third-party stakeholders. He knows that in Europe, ratio shareholders are backed by recent decisions of the Court of Justice, which outlaw the sales of devices with preloaded pirate add-ons. However, there's a lot, still a lot more work to be done to crack down on this emerging uh, piracy threat. Uh, this is an area where innovation and response are required, and we have to be just as good as the pirates to think of new ways to tackle these challenges. Um, I'm not sure how they can really truly combat combat this. Um, these these pirate sticks, if you will, are so easy to make and it's so easy to add on. I'm not sure what the proper solution is for them other than um, lower your prices, get more inventive, make it so that, you know, your shows are streamed like what Netflix has done globally and on the same day. Uh, The other thing I could think of is maybe, I don't know, lower the price of the internet. If you honestly lower the price of the internet, if the internet were something like, not necessarily a coffee, but it were like 20 bucks a month, for unlimited access to the internet, you wouldn't have these problems with uh, piracy. People would pay for uh, things like uh, HBO Go and Netflix and Hulu and stuff off of Google Play and what's about to happen with YouTube. Uh, They would pay for that. But right now, with the way the cable companies and the ISPs are, if you're paying for without cable, just for internet, anywhere from 55 to 100 bucks for 
not even the best service, you're going to get piracy. It's just it's just what it is. Uh, people like to be entertained. They want to be entertained. They seek to be entertained. And if you want to, I just it's just about pricing and marketing. And and I, I think um, honestly, you know that there, there needs to be that there's we're really fighting an uphill battle. And I think whatever legislative laws are going to come out from this is not going to be the best thing for uh, the internet in general. And speaking of not, was not good for the internet, um, BPI breaks record of sending 310 million Google takedowns. This is still from Torrent Freak. Uh, the BPI reached another landmark after piracy takedowns sent to Google smashed the 300 million barrier. Uh, the music industry group says in the, it, this has now sent more than 310 million requests to delist infringing URLs, but informs TF that the takedown and stay down regime could really help to bring volumes under control. A little over a year ago, during March uh, 2016, the music industry group BPI reached an important milestone. After years of sending takedown notices to Google, the group burst through the 200 million URL barrier. The fact it took BPI several years to reach the 200 million milestone made the surpassing of the quarter billion milestone a few months later even more remarkable. In October 2016, the group sent in 250 million takedown to Google, a figure that nearly doubled when accounting for notices sent to Microsoft's Bing. But despite the volumes, the battle has been won, let alone the war. The BPI's takedown machine continues to run a remarkable rate, turning out millions more notices per week. As a result, another new milestone was reached this month when the BPI smashed through a 300 million URL barrier. The day later, a further 10 million were added, with a latter couple of million added during the time it took to put this piece together. While demanding that Google places greater emphasis on its de-ranking and the pirate sites, the BPI has called again and again for a notice to stay down regime to ensure that content taken down by the search engine doesn't necessarily reappear under a new URL. It's a position the BPI maintains today. The battle should be a whole lot easier if intermediaries played fair, said BPI spokesman Bush and Inform CF. The need to make more proactive responsibility to reduce infringed content that appears on the platform and where we express especially notify infringing content to them to ensure that they do not take it down, but also keep it down. The long-standing suggestion is that the volume takedown notices sent would reduce if a takedown stay down regime was implemented. The, BP, the BPI says it's difficult to present a precise figure, but infringed content has a tendency to reappear both in search engines and hosting sites. Google rejects repeat notices of the same URL, but illegal content reappears as it's re-indexed by Google. As to the sites that actually host the content, the vast majority of the notices sent to them could be avoided if they implemented takedown and stay down, uh, BPI says. The fact that BPI has added, has added 60 million more takedowns since the quarter billion milestone a few months ago is quite remarkable, particularly since the, this appears to be a, slow, a little slowdown from month to month. However, the numbers have grown so huge that 310 billion now feels like 250 million with just a few added on top of good measure. The extra 60 million takedowns can almost be dismissed as a handful and an, an indication of just how massive the issue is online. While pirates always welcome an abundance of links to juicy content, it's no surprise that the groups like BPI are seeking more comprehensive and substantial solutions. Previously, it was hoped that the Digital Economy Bill will provide some relief, hopefully via government intervention and imposition of search engine code of practice. In the event, however, all the pressures on the search engine were, was removed from the legislation after a separate voluntary agreement was reached. All parties agree that the voluntary code should come into effect two weeks ago on June 1st, so it seems likely some effect will be noticeable in the near future, but the BPI says it's still early days and some more work to be done. Uh, BPI has been working productively with search engines since the voluntary code was agreed to understand how search engines approach the problem, but also what changes can and have been made and how results can be improved. The first stage is to benchmark where we are and to assess the impact of the changing changes search engines have made so far. This will hopefully be complete soon. Uh, this will have a better information on the current picture and from what we hope to work together to continue to improve search for rights to owners and consumers. With more takedown notices in the pipeline not yet publicly reported by Google, the BPI informs TF that it has now notified the search sites of three, 315 million links to illegal content. That's an astounding number. More than 1 in 10 of the entire world's notices to Google come from BPI. This year alone, 1 in every 3 notices sent to Google from BPI is for, a, is for an independent record label uh, repertory, BPI concludes. While it's clear that groups like BPI have developed systems to cope with a huge number of takedown notices requiring its today's environment, it's clear that few right shareholders are happy with the status quo. 
Uh, with that in mind, the fight will continue until search engines are forced into a compromise. And considering the implications, this could only appear on a very distant hi- horizon. Um, yeah, uh, again, the, you can't lock down the internet, and the more and more you try, the, the more more inventive people are going to get, and more likely they're going to go underground, and you're going to see a rise of uh, decentralized systems, and then, then what? Uh, Purse blog. Uh, announcement. Press is partnering with Mycelium. Uh, a little bit of an update of a, a company that we reviewed. Uh, Press plus Mycelium. Uh, making new friends. Uh, working tirelessly week after week, a commitment to introduce Bitcoin to the masses remains unrelenting. However, trying to educate the entire globe on the benefits of benefits that Bitcoin and digital currencies will bring to the world is quite the task. And it should come to no surprise that reaching 7 plus billion people on this planet is no small effort. Luckily, Bitcoin continues to grow exponentially, not only in price, but also in valued added services. Partnering with wallet services in particular, like Mycelium, are a great way for individuals to get introduced to Bitcoin. Mycelium is a trusted wallet service used by many all over the world, and one with an impressive user base. Got Bitcoin, now what? Wallet services play a crucial part in the onboarding of new users. Once someone has purchased Bitcoin from Mycelium local trader, ATM, Coinbase, or other services, they'll need to eventually use those funds to truly understand the power of what, is the, what it is they now possess. Partnering with Purse provides the company Mycelium a revenue stream, enabling them to continually deliver new features and integrations to their users. At the same time, users in the Mycelium app can now be directed to the value-added platforms like Purse, where they can spend their Bitcoin and shop for goods at discount. Uh, new users of Bitcoin have to learn how to best utilize and secure their digital wealth, New found partnerships like these ensure we can educate as many future Bitcoin evan- evangelicals as possible. The partnership will go live in the coming weeks, and users of the Mycelium Wallet will be able to discover Purse right from the Mycelium Mobile app, with the potential for deeper, deeper integration in the future as we continue to expand on the service. I think this is pretty awesome. Um, I, I imagine as time goes on, you're going to see more and more wallets uh, integrate with other platforms to where you can just basically direct buy within the app, which is something that's already going on in, I, I guess you could say, regular mainstream apps, um, particularly with, you know, WeChat in uh, China is uh, known for this. Uh, but to see Bitcoin already getting into this space is, and cryptocurrencies in general, is great. So that is it for the news. On for, to the review of 20. 20- so 21co is a bitcoin company it's in the bitcoin space and it's done a number of a couple of different things and, and we'll break down a couple of those things that it's done but i just want to kind of give an overview of uh where it's headquartered uh who the founders are and how you would categorize it so so it's based in san francisco california um its founders are bali s sarvin uh, matt back backer Rabin uh, Kertipal, uh, Nigel uh, Dergo, and Daniel Fur. It was founded in May of 2013. Uh, it's 21 Incorporated or 21 Co. Uh, based in Silicon Valley, it's a Bitcoin startup that enables users to build, buy, and sell machine payable apps with developers from all around the world. Uh, the company provides its users with an embedded mining chip that can be integrated to any internet connected device, thereby supporting a continuous stream of digital currencies for use in a variety of applications. Uh, 21Co was founded in 2013. Uh, it's had a couple different run fundraises. It had two rounds from 16 investors. It has a total equity of $121 million. Um, the most recent one was a Series B one, which was $116 million uh, back in March uh, 10th of 2015. So it has quite a bit of moolah, if you will, associated with it. Uh, his first funding was only $5 million, which was a Series A. It had uh, three uh, investors and then 13 in March of 2015, the biggest being Andres uh, Hortz in the RE Venture. And all that information came from uh, Crunchbase. So I have a link to not only directly to their, their site, their Slack channel, this uh, Crunchbase information, but also their LinkedIn. So what does that mean, the machinable Internet of Things? Well, what 21 Code did uh, when it first really started out is that it built a little device. So 21 Co. came onto the scene with a machine. It's called a 21 computer. And what it was was a full node uh, with the software packages built in as well as a ASIC mining machine. So it allowed you to run a full uh, Bitcoin node. It allowed a software, uh, the software, uh, easy setup software programming for running the node. But also in addition to that, it allowed you to, it allowed a 
a series of libraries, if you will, that allowed you to do API calls, to be able to develop and create things with this particular computer, as well as an ASIC machine that allowed you to mine Bitcoin. Uh, bundled all together, it was intended to not only allow for a greater distribution of Bitcoin nodes out there in the network, but also allow for um, 21 code to get into the Internet of Things market, but most, most importantly, the machinable market. The, the thing that people, a lot of people are doing, which are like you know, AI machines or bots or little Internet uh, machines that allow you to do these calls a simple task and have it all automated and get paid for. And 21Co, uh, in addition to this machine that they put out there, they have created a marketplace where you can uh, perform these tasks and sell your information and, and receive money. Or even uh, if a job is put out there, uh, you could uh, receive uh, Bitcoin for, the, for doing the task with your machine. Now, their machine runs around $400, uh, but there is some DIY uh, efforts where you basically, because basically what it is is a Raspberry Pi with an ASIC chip on top, and you can actually uh, put things together and even download their information for about 70 bucks. and we'll go get into that. But I'm going to read some articles about this particular machine as well as a review, because I personally um, don't have one, and I have not um, built one myself. But here we go. So here's a review. Here's what they state their machines for. Uh, this comes out October 5th of 2015. Uh, the 21 full node, nodes index um, by uh, AD Yao and uh, Bog, Bog GS a servant. This is on Medium. Uh, so Bitcoin full nodes help preserve the health of the Bitcoin network by validating blocks and transactions and then sending those validated transactions to lightweight clients and other full nodes. This helps blocks and transactions propagate quickly and navigate their way past obstacles in the network, ensuring that everyone has full access to the blockchain. This is very true for places like, you know, China, which has the firewall, places that have, may have a, a little slower internet or there's a firewall issue. Uh, by allowing enough nodes distributed throughout the world and on different types of networks, you're able to ensure the, the strength of the Bitcoin community, if you will. As lightweight clients currently make up a significant and growing part of the network, it's essential that we help to maintain their high level security, which means maintaining a critical, critical mass of full nodes. We're contributing that in three ways better metrics, greater ease of usage, and mining incentives. Better metrics. As Lord Kelvin noted, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. Thus, the first part of ensuring that Bitcoin is full, has enough full nodes is to measure the number of full nodes currently operating. Um, my Bitcoin, Bitcoin nodes project has been doing this since May 13th by carefully crawling the Bitcoin network every five minutes to see which nodes are serving data. The full node exit is now hosted in the info tree at the Bitcoin nodes, uh, co, which you can visit uh, for all your full node needs. And that's another service that they provide. They provide um, a good hard measured data of all the nodes that are available and this is important to get that information. They're not the only one that does it, but it's good to check between the different node services to see you know, how people are crawling and which nodes are available and, and get accurate information. So ease of usage. The second part of improving the full node count is to make the full nodes easy to deploy. We took a step towards this with Bitcoin Nodes Hardware Project, a dedicated full node. Uh, we think the next logical step is a 21 Bitcoin computer, which includes full, full node functionality out of the box, alongside many other features like embedded mining and micropayment. Fear not, however, not only will we be supporting existing customers on the Bitcoin Nodes forum, but Bitcoin node customers can get in touch with us at um, Bitcoin nodes at 21.co to receive a discount on your order of a 21 Bitcoin computer. Uh, mining incentives. Uh, the third step is to add a sufficient incentive for running a full node. Uh, Satoshi so thought through many corner, many, many corner cases and incentive issues when she, he, they designed Bitcoin. But they arguably did incentivize people sufficiently to run full nodes. Thus, perhaps predictably, the number of full nodes has been declined. So as a generalization, Bitcoin nodes is sent to be you'd be mining more Bitcoin on 21 Bitcoin computer if you run it in a full node mode. Think of it as extra BTC that you can earn from being a good member of the Bitcoin community. While investigating more ways to improve the full, full node count in the days ahead, you can get started today by browsing the updated index uh, at their site and ordering a 21 Bitcoin computer so that you can be able to participate in the 21 full node incentive program from the very start. Here's to increasing the number of full nodes and improving the health of the Bitcoin network. So this is a um, fairly easy deployable uh, node machine. It's not that big. 
Uh, currently, as of today, uh, through their website, there's 7,538 nodes. Uh, just to kind of break down by country here, they have it to decide. Uh, 2,161 of them are in the United States. Germany has 1,300. In 81, France 525, Netherlands 417, Canada 321, Connecticut 20, 271. Uh, they have number seven is NA, they don't have a specified country, which is 265. Uh, the Russian Federation is 239, China is 238, Singapore is 121, and then everyone else is kind of like really like single digits or double digits here. Uh, a lot of countries. Saudi Arabia is one, Philippines, Gone, Belize, Laos, People Democratic Republic is one, Net Korean, uh, Netherlands, Antilles is one, Taiwan has 19, Slovenia 14, just kind of skip around here. Sweden has 101, I think I already said that, Finland 60, Poland 53, Brazil 39, they're having some trouble down there in Brazil, Argentina 15, uh, South Africa 24. So as you can see, even in places where they're, you know, westernized and, you know, first world, they have very low uh, node counts. Uh, Israel, 16. New Zealand, 13. So, it's fairly distributed. There is pretty much a node on every continent except for maybe Antarctica. So, you can run a full node on either Linux, Mac, or BSD, or Windows systems um, to help out it, um, validate and relay transactions across the BitNet network. By running this command, and then they have it embedded right here. To run. And you can run. Uh, they offer two two versions: uh, Bitcoin Classic or Bitcoin Core for running a full node. So that's um, interesting on their part. The machine itself, like I said, is basically a Raspberry Pi um, with an ASIC chip embedded in it. is not that big. It's you know credit card size. Uh, you can pretty much plug and um, set up. They have a setup system where you can set up. Uh, they have automated and manual if there's an issue with your operating system, maybe you're, I don't know, on Windows XP or anything like that. Uh, so I'm just kind of read, you know, right here, getting started. Um, if you receive your 21 Bitcoin co computer box by the mail, you're just a few minutes away from booting up. You can do this from the existing Mac, Windows, or Linux machine. Um, alternatively, if you have a spare keyboard or monitor, you can also set up your 21 computer as a standalone, standalone Linux box. Uh, full instructions are below for all the four of these use cases. The setup process will take about 10 to 15 minutes, and once you're done, you'll be able to mine some Bitcoin and start building your first big, first Bitcoin apps. So it's Ubuntu ready. Uh, you can choose your system. Uh, you can choose auto version here. Uh, step two is you can plug in, connect to the Wi-Fi adapter, uh, insert the so it comes with the Wi-Fi adapter, connecting cables, um, and connect to your USB laptop. Uh, it connects to the power, it has a power cable, it's full kit, it has everything you pretty much need. Um, so you can do it by Linux if you choose to do so, I have a, a Linux, so I don't know. Um, I'm going to eventually uh, try and test out uh, these different um, downloadable um, Bitcoin nodes, if you will, uh, that is out there available. Um, I'm going to spend like a, a weekend doing that. And Kind of give you my thoughts on this, but at this time, I, I personally did not uh, download their um, their node. I just wanted to focus on the, the the programs that I do use that they offer. They also, in their setup program, uh, show how you can build more Bitcoin apps with the use of their their twenty one computer with the use of their program. Basically, so they have this marketplace. It's called the Twenty One Marketplace, and you can do things like uh, zip code data. Ping 21 aggregated, company logo API, part of a speech tagger, uh, Twitter influence ranking, order list of Twitter users, uh, geocode. So there's all these different little apps. Um, and you can get you know, paid like 3,500 Satoshi, 100,000 Satoshi, or uh, two bucks, things of that nature. And it's all an effort to try to create, you know, buy and sell Bitcoin portable, payable API. Now, with their launch of their machine in this marketplace, while it wasn't exactly a dud, it wasn't lighting fire within the community in and of itself. And I think a lot of it has to do with the price. I mean, there, as soon as it came out and people had to look at it, uh, there was UI hacks on how to create your own uh, 21 computer machine 
uh, with a Raspberry Pi and add in an ASIC chip far less than the $400 and gain the software program. Um, also, there was people that are saying, you know, you don't have to do run the mining. Uh, you can do it through, which most people do with the Raspberry Pi uh, nodes. You can uh, pretty much download their node uh, program and not have the ASIC chip. So it was a bit of dud in that sense. But the concept of making a node very easy, deployable, uh, is very important. And if they were ever to drop that price into something more uh, feasible, either somewhere around the hundred dollar range, I think that they would have a very viable product for the masses. But at the present time, I mean, they're sold out. You can get it on Amazon and stuff like that. But uh, it's not something that they are consistently developing. I mean, they still have it and they're still doing it somewhat, but it's they've moved on to other areas. And those other areas are, in fact, um, compatible, if you will. Uh, one of the things they do is um, because of the things that are going on within the uh, cryptocurrency space, particularly concerning fees, you can go and predict your Bitcoin fees for transactions through uh, 21 Co. You can look and see what's going on and figure out how much um, you know your fee should be for your type of transaction and can get that input information. Was it important for people that to find out, you know, how many unconfirmed transactions are happening, how many uh, transactions happen per day? This is like a, a little informational thing that they do on the benefit for the community, uh, besides the Bitcoin. But what they have done and what is really actually gaining, gaining significant traction within the community is they have what is called um, a payable email service. And what that email service is, is basically built on the concept of real identity. Uh, you know, you can create your identity, uh, gets verified from them by adding, you know, social media services. And you put up your email. And this email going through them, like for example, I have an email through them, it's really just shy, uh, 21 Co. And someone can email me a question. So they can email me anything. They might want to know, you know, why don't you do a podcast about Litecoin? And then if I answer that email, I have it set at a certain increment of amount of money. So with each person is different. Uh, you can do one, five, I think ten, or even as high as a hundred dollars. So if someone were to send me this email and I were to answer it, um, they would pay uh, one dollar, and that one dollar would go to me. Uh, same thing if I were to send somebody an email and they were to answer it and whatever their price they set, whether it be one dollar, five dollars, or uh, ten dollars or a hundred dollars, um, I would pay that to them and they would answer my particular question. And it's a way of, you know, addressing particularly high level individuals, if you will, uh, basically your attention, you know, marketing attention and, and getting value from their attention. Uh, the other thing that they do is they do these surveys from the community, you know, trying to check and see, you know, what the community is seeking and, and what they're doing. So, for example, we see this all the time. You see these Google surveys. Hey, fill this out for whatever particular company, but you're, you don't get paid or get any value. There used to be very early on, like, you get, like, a gift card. And some places still do the gift card. Or you get um, maybe a discount or something like that through that particular website. But in general, you're just giving them all this information. And getting no reward. Here you do. You get, you know, either paid a dollar, fifty cents, ten cents, twenty five cents, uh, a little bit of uh, money in Bitcoin that you can, you know, keep in there. The wallet that's held on here, or you can transfer it to your own personal Bitcoin wallet, or you can actually uh, donate to uh, these listed charities that they have add, added on here. And basically, it's just a way of paying people for their their time. They also have what is. Um, a bundle package where you they brought in these because of and uh, andrean Fort's um pool if you will they got these um ceos and these uh, vcs where you can speak to these high level um individuals within this tech space and 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 get you know a feedback from them so ceo get replies from 100 plus ceos for 20 dollars per reply uh, they have a VC one, get uh, 50 plus VCs for $50 per reply. Uh, get replies from 50 plus angel investors, $20 per reply. Uh, get replies from 400 plus startup founders for $20 per reply. Uh, get replies from 200 plus blockchain personalities for $10 per reply. 
uh, Digital Group Currency Group, which is a big investor. Replies on 24, scan for any visit, commemorates for $5 reply. So they did A116, which is uh, Andrean Sports Partners, for $50 for reply. Uh, replies from Stanford, Stanford students. Uh, get replies from uh, 1,000 plus Ethereum buyers for $10. Get replies from 47 research scientists, embedded developers. All this, you know, Monero, all these different bundle packages where if you were to, um, you can either do it individually or do it through these packages. You can develop a, you know, call list, a networking um, function or anything like that and get, you know, pick the brains of these eight people. You know, if you ask the right type of question, they reply. Maybe it's the same question, but phrased different ways to um, different developers and bundle it in. And for a very, if you think about it, for a pretty reasonable price, you can pick the minds of some leading um, members of the industry and you can build from there. If you have a business, if you're seeking employment, or if you're just trying to network and build um, a reputation, you can, in essence, uh, garner some the networking mechanism I think and a far more valuable one than say something like LinkedIn uh, or um, regular emails or cold calling or even just going to meetups or something like that you're basically paying this person for their attention and it's not like a significant amount especially considering like a number of these CEOs where they go to speaking engagements are commanding like ten thousand five thousand to even a hundred thousand dollars per speaking engagement and the likelihood of you as an individual out in the crowd being able to actually engage with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis is very very limited here's a very effective way of doing this and um, not only that but for these type of individuals uh it demonstrates your kind of seriousness you're, you're putting money into this you're putting it through bitcoin if you will plus it allows them to have a bit of control because uh, if they don't reply you don't pay out um it kind of gives the indication of you know if someone's not replying to your question maybe you need to reword it rework it redo it it kind of gives you that kind of indicator but when someone does reply they're they're going to give you your their full attention to you and, and actually uh because you're you're paying them in essence they're going to give you your twenty dollars worth your five dollars worth your even your hundred dollars worth if you contact someone on an individual basis so this i think is very significant because it shows particularly at this 10 20 uh five dollar um level even with the bitcoin fee issue this shows you know it's possible to do micro transactions on the internet um it's a big key component about cryptocurrencies uh, as a, a digital transaction and digital money is to be able to do these small micro uh, transactions and with frictionless uh, means of doing so and you know 21 Co is getting into this I know LinkedIn does this with their service where they have this paid email service but I think it's a way out there as far as for most people unless you're really serious or business oriented but for the average person, it's kind of they're priced out. But for something like this, the average person is not priced out. So if you're starting out, if you're young, or if you're starting out in your business, or if you're just very curious, or you're a very big fan of a particular personality or an individual, and you want to ask them some questions, this is a very effective and efficient manner to do. Um, at the same time, people can ask you questions if you have a skill set, if you're you know, making Ethereum smart contracts, or if you're making like, you like myself podcast shows. Is a way for people to pick your brain as well by putting yourself out there. So I'm just going to read a couple articles here. Um, this is actually from 21, and it's about AOWS hosts a deep learning endpoint. Um, AOWS pricing outline managing AOS from Python, uh, the Django um, app for deep learning. So using 21 and AWS to host a deep learning endpoint. In this tutorial, we'll set up a Bitcoin payable API for a deep learning algorithm using Amazon's web service for computational backend. This algorithm will serve an example of an artistic style transfer algorithm that applies the artistic style of one image to another image. So uh, you might see those, um, what is those it's Google deep web images, those uh, computer generated AI images where they take um, a photo and they get turned into a Picasso, or you submit a photo and you just let the um, computer look at it and figure out what it, it thinks the image is and you get like these weird colors and transfers and like dog faces and things of that nature and that's what this is is an example of this and this is again what they're trying to do to do this machinable learning marketplace if you will and working with aws to do this and having you the once you the task like aws does all this information from you 
and it kicks it out to your API for the Bitcoin, then you're going to get, you know, paid and kind of get priced it out and, and, and um, get money in the, in, in the process. And I have a link in the show notes for this. But again, this is just another thing that they're trying to do to broaden the scope of the utility of um, Bitcoin, if you will, and these type of systems, in particular, their, their little uh, node computer thing that they have out there. So this is from Coindesk. Um, it was written by Bailey Wetzel. LinkedIn killer Bitcoin upstart 21 takes on social with email play. So the crypto Bitcoin company 21 Incorporated uh, has launched a paid email platform that seems far removed from its initial focus on hardware. The move is yet another string of pivots by the firm since it revealed it raised 116 million in 2015. 21 has evolved the strategy several times. Originally founded as a Bitcoin mining company, it soon appointed the new CEO, Andrea Ortz's partner, Balji Savines, and announced plans to distribute Bitcoin mining chips embedded in the consumers and um, enterprise hardware devices. The chips attached to a Raspberry Pi and called 21 computers. Chips starting in November 2015, and quickly the developers began building applications for the device. Then in March 2016, the, the company launched its first proof of concept for a network device incentive to monitor websites with Bitcoin. Several months later, it launched a software package that allowed any connected device to join the 21 network, enabling connect capabilities that once were only available to those with a 21 Bitcoin computer. Uh, so the new communication platform seems to be yet another evolution for the 21 Incorporated. So Sarvisen says the company is working on, working on this idea for some time, pointing to an SMS version of the current project that they published in late 2015. Further, the CEO says the email platform aligns with the company's primary goal. Allowing people to earn Bitcoin by responding to emails that include tasks he achieves many of the same goals in it that many that many that may get millions of people their first exposure to digital currency. In the old SMS version, uh, 21 Incorporated showed users how to set up a 20 Bitcoin computer that allowed them to receive paid text messages from anyone without receiving and receiving its number. The new platform, which allows users to set their own rate, makes the service accessible to people without even the computer's hard company's hardware. Uh, rewarding the recipients. The new service available via the website and a Mac OS app looks similar to uh, the LinkedIn InMail, which uh, Savannah says is the platform's closest competitor. And some enthusiasts, including Craig Lara, an angel investor and mentor to tech stars and Evo Nexus, has even made it public that they rather use 21 platform only. That's probably because, according to Savannah, the recipients get paid instead of the social network giant. Now, on LinkedIn, pain is made to send, to send email to people outside your network or take it by LinkedIn itself. But on a 21 platform, the money goes straight to the recipient. Most of all, when the user send an email, 21 adds a 10% fee to transactions. For instance, you send an email to someone charging uh, $1 means $1.10 total. The small fee bill has the potential to turn big revenue for 21. In mail, nonetheless, estimates to be a $300 million per year business for LinkedIn, and we think the market could expand as recipients get paid. Premium prices. This is especially true for well known early adopters keep setting high prices, and people are prepared, prepared to pay for them. Um, Andrea Swartz, Ben Hortz, set his account at $100 via service for such high value. Some wonder what benefit of using Bitcoin would be, night, would be since in this case it might be easy to add a debit or credit card payment. And what Steven contains there are several advantages. It allows instant receipt, receipts of funds without linking a bank account. It works across borders and it can scale up down to very small and large payments alike. Uh, this appreciation also seems why people have rushed the new service and since users can make $2 and they're going to just move you through how the site works with setting up an account. Uh, the mechanism for offer, offer, offering monetary value for tasks and real missions for 21 platform funds uh, the goal is to make possible to send targeted tasks to people in, in the same ways that you, the resume qualifies you for an uh, offline job, the verified 21 profile policy for online tasks and payable in Bitcoin. Uh, think of it a hybrid of a LinkedIn and an Amazon um, local server. And I think that eventually as things ramp up, and this is something they, they can do. Uh, mixed reviews. Uh, John Light, head of product marketing at Arbor, a Bitcoin based mobile app for Mitmantis, suggested the paid email use case is merely a way to market the task platform. Uh, the email application seems like a useful idea, especially for those getting a lot of inbound requests and they need to apply some filter to decide what's worth responding to, especially if those people are outside your network. Uh, like I said, the message project is also very useful because of public facing and access and marketing tool. Although others like Wayne Vaughn, founder and CEO of uh, Chairman remain skeptical not only for the paid inbox but also for the tax platform. In today's world, social signals such as being introduced by a mutual friend 
are generally seen as more valuable than monetary compensation and bond suggests. Putting a price on that is like if I want to tell you something interesting, but you ask for fifty dollars to do that, I want to tell you to go screw yourself instead. Not to mention the high prices, but some people, such as young entrepreneurs or developers and small pub publication journalists, at a disadvantage. It is not a perfect solution to see the light, but it's a new option for purely unsolicited messages, no pre applied uh, filter. Of course, there will always be uh, other channels in which people can reach out, such as public networking like Twitter. Or on these, though, the account holders aren't guaranteed to respond, so surely, like I said, that would become a paper too. As an added incentive for some, the money received from incoming emails or income tasks can be donated to three different tech savvy and Bitcoin friendly charities since recent. Because price is a signal, signal money can be, can be a very interesting way to prioritize messages. At the same time, the recipient often don't actually need the money, but donating is a good cause and a creative solution. So, in general, uh, even with the pivots and the things that they change from being a Bitcoin mining company and having a bit of an overpriced machine, and I have a review of the machine uh, from someone else here embedded in the uh, show notes here. I think that their social aspect of doing a micro task and being paid for email services and the, the good that they do do with the Bitcoin note count and the um, Bitcoin fee and people know what fees they have to do to pay for um, their transaction as well as allowing and opening up their software to where anyone can download uh, their node version, their full node version, allowing for APIs to be out there is, is a very good thing. I think it's going to allow and drive for uh, better usability and openness of Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's going to allow for more people to participate within this ecosystem. And it's going to allow for a better uh, networking and, and marketing mechanism within the Bitcoin space, which it desperately needs. Uh, marketing is a very big big, big issue with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general. And this is a great avenue for them to market Bitcoin in and of itself um, out there in not only just within the space of tech space, in the Bitcoin space, or the community, the cryptocurrency community, but globally as well. Overall, um, the service that I do utilize, which is their email service and their task service, and I also use uh, their Bitcoin fee service look up to, to send my Bitcoins are... Um, I know what amount I need to send. Um, I would recommend utilizing that if that's something you're into. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're getting into this space and you are looking to develop either an API or a program or anything like that and you want to pick the minds of those that have already gone before you or in this space, I think this is probably the best av one of the best avenues. Twitter is another big avenue, and Twitter is free. Uh, but I think if you want a strong clarity and a one-on-one -on -one thing, I think if you have the Bitcoin, if you have the, the crypto and convert it into Bitcoin, I would use this platform. So overall, their software program and service, I would give it a 4 out of 5. I think there's a few things that they can work on. I think um, I think being able to have a little bit more detailed uh, profile, if you will, that most social media services have um, when you click on is good. I think they need to have a more flexible payment structure, if you will. Uh, I think it would be um, allow for greater adoption. I also think that they, I didn't quite see it, but maybe something they'll incorporate a buy in a mechanism to buy Bitcoin through the usage of their email service, whether it's using Coinbase or BitPay or local Bitcoin or some other um, exchange or deal embedded into their system, or even a wallet program like a MyCLN wallet would be, would be awesome. Um, as for the Bitcoin mining, I think that's a done deal for them considering they opened up the software but it could have been better if, if it was just like half that you know if it was like xbox price it was like a hundred bucks that people could pick up i think people, more and more people would justify purchasing purchasing that machine instead of going out and doing it themselves a hundred buck machine versus a 400 book uh book uh bitcoin mining that's not even capable of actual other mining machines out there you know a couple but couple hundred bucks more and you can have like a really good mining machine that actually garners you greater value in uh, Bitcoin as far as mine. But that is my review. I highly recommend it. I would, I would look at it, see if you, you know, get verified, get your profile out there and, you know, start networking if you can. So that's it uh, for Hoja's Thought Bubble. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. 
This has been a Hiroshima Space Odyssey Network production. <laughs>